Welcome to episode four of the Investor's Guide to Battery Materials. This is part of a regular series providing both private and professional investors with all the information that they're likely to need in order to help them invest in the world of battery materials. As I flagged before, I think one of the most exciting but least understood battery materials is high purity manganese. Our last episode dealt with the demand drivers for high purity manganese, and in this episode, I'm going to discuss factors that impact supply and also give a few pointers that investors should be aware of when evaluating manganese developers and producers. Before we start, I'll just give a quick introduction. My name is Matt Fernley, and I'm Managing Director of Battery Materials Review. I've been an equity analyst specializing in the mining and basic materials sectors for over 20 years. During that time, I've been a broker as well as an investor, both professional and private, and I've written a number of primers on various aspects of the mining sector to help explain them to investors. I started Battery Materials Review a few years ago as a one-stop shop for everything investors and companies would need to know about what's going on in the wider battery and battery materials sectors. I'd also like to specifically thank this edition's sponsor, which is Euromanganese. Euromanganese is a Canadian battery materials company whose principal focus is advancing the evaluation and development of the Qualitize Manganese project in which it holds a 100% interest. The proposed project entails reprocessing a significant manganese deposit hosted in historic mine tailings from a decommissioned mine strategically located in the Czech Republic. Euromanganese's goal is to become a leading, competitive and environmentally superior primary producer of ultra-high purity manganese products in the heart of Europe, serving both the lithium ion battery industry as well as producers of specialty steel and aluminium alloys. In the first episode on manganese, I talked about how I expect demand for a particular subset of manganese, high purity manganese, to rise by more than 10 times over the next 10 years. This will be driven by the utilization of high purity manganese in high nickel battery chemistries. Since I published the last episode, Volkswagen has also announced plans to utilize a nickel manganese battery for their mass market vehicles. So we now have both Volkswagen and Tesla planning to utilize high manganese chemistries in their mass market vehicles. I also talked about how high purity manganese is a tiny percentage of the manganese market at only 0.15%. The high purity manganese that's used for high nickel batteries is in no way comparable with the manganese that's used for the steel industry. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about how high purity manganese is manufactured and why not all manganese deposits are suitable to manufacture high purity manganese. In terms of supply, South Africa is the world's largest producer of manganese, with Australia and Gabon in second and third places. While most of South Africa's production goes into the steel industry because of the high purity of its manganese ores, a small amount of South African product from one producer in particular also goes into the battery material industry. Before I go on, let's just recap on the precursor materials used to make battery manganese. As I noted in the first presentation, there are two key precursor materials. High purity manganese sulfate monohydrate, which is known as HPMSM, and high purity electrolytic manganese metal, which is known as HPEMM. Not particularly catchy, I know, but they're going to come up again in a second, and I wanted to make sure I explained what I was going to be talking about. Currently, HPMSM is the key manganese precursor for all high nickel battery production. Okay, so let's talk about how we get to those precursors. There are two types of primary manganese ore bodies found in nature, ore bodies based on carbonate and on oxide minerals. Manganese oxide ore bodies are the most common and represent around 98% of global manganese resources. Carbonate ore bodies are generally relatively small scale and lower grade than oxide ore bodies and require initial treatment prior to smelting, so haven't really been preferred for manganese production for the steel industry historically. Known manganese carbonate ore bodies may be found in China, the Czech Republic, Georgia, Mexico, Russia and Ukraine. The reason this is relevant is that manganese carbonate ore bodies are by far the easiest to convert to HPMSM. Carbonate ore bodies 
are amenable to direct leaching utilizing sulfuric acid, which after certain purification steps produces HPMSM. While oxide ores can be upgraded to HPMSM, the process is much more involved, which has implications for both cost and sustainability. For oxide ores to be processed, they must first be calcined, which requires the oxide ore to be heated to high temperatures, which tends to be power intensive. They can then be upgraded to 99.9% .9 pure HPMM through a process of dissolution, purification and electro winning. The HPEMM produced can then be leached using sulfuric acid to produce HPMSM. Currently, there are at least three suppliers in China utilizing the HPEMM route to produce high purity sulfate. The largest producer of HPEMM is Manganese Metal Company of South Africa, which utilizes manganese oxide ore and currently exports over 30,000 tons per year of HPEMM to various cathode producers. The key issue from a sustainability point of view is that both China's and South Africa's power grids are primarily driven by hydrocarbon sources and thus are substantial greenhouse gas emitters. In addition, from a cost point of view, I'm sure anyone can see that the extra processing required to go through the oxide route is substantially more expensive than utilizing carbonate ore bodies. The scarcity of carbonate ores, however, makes the processing of oxide ore bodies a necessity for the industry going forward. In the previous presentation, I talked about purity requirements in battery precursor materials, and I'd like to discuss purity requirements again with regards to processing of oxide ores. One of the factors that makes the process for the production of high purity manganese metal from oxide ores expensive is that it must be a totally separate processing pathway from oxide ore that is being upgraded to 99.7% EMM for non-battery uses. And that's because of the presence of selenium in processing. Selenium is routinely added in the production of EMM to suppress hydrogen evolution and improve current efficiency during electrolysis, which lowers the costs. But this can yield products that can contain up to 1800 parts per million of selenium. And since the cutoff for selenium in batteries is three parts per million, that ain't great. So as a result of this direct production of HPMSM from the EMM used for most industries is not viable. The metallic precursor for HPMSM has to be manufactured discreetly as selenium-free 99.9% EMM, which is known as HPEMM. This increases the production costs substantially. So now we know how difficult it is to produce HPMSM, we can perhaps understand a little bit more why there's such a dearth of new project developers in this space. Raw material projects and operations that I'm currently tracking are the Qualitize project in the Czech Republic, which is being developed by Euromanganese, the Cahill project in Botswana, which is being developed by Gianni Metals, the Butcherbird project in Australia, which is being developed by Element 25. The Umbombella operation in South Africa, which is in production, but where an expansion is under consideration. And the Battery Hill project in New Brunswick, Canada, which is at a very early stage. There are also some early stage oxide and carbonate projects in Gabon, which are currently private. Given that most of these projects are unlikely to come into production within the next three to four years and could be considerably further out, it looks likely to me that HPEMM and HPMSM prices are likely to increase a fair amount in that time due to scarcity of material. I just wanted to talk briefly about the modeling and valuation of new high purity manganese projects. Because this is such a poorly understood sector, Investors often miss out on key factors in company development releases that are really important. Here's a list of points that investors should be looking to bring up or to understand when they're looking to evaluate a high purity manganese project. Firstly, is the ore body carbonate or oxide? And on top of that, what is its grade? Carbonate ore bodies will support substantially lower manganese grades than oxide ones. If the company is looking to develop an oxide project, given the amount of processing that is likely to be necessary, then manganese grades of 10 to 15% should be considered the minimum. 
As with all mining projects, there are also general mining issues as well. Number one, the ore body size. Is it big enough to support the project for long enough to justify the upfront capital investment? Another issue, the orientation and position of the ore body. Are we talking about open pit or underground mining? Does the shape of the ore body lend itself to mass mining? An additional question is regarding location and infrastructure. Most importantly, the existence of power, transportation infrastructure and water. Will processing take place at the mine site, in which case power, water and reagents will need to be brought in? Or will the concentrate need to be shipped, which may entail additional costs? A second key issue that's relevant to battery materials is how much upfront testing has a developer done or are they planning to do? When we talk about high purity manganese products for electric vehicle batteries, qualification of material is of increasing importance. Metallurgical testing is of enormous importance. It's important that enough drilling takes place so that chemical variations in the ore body can be understood. Spacings must be tight at least tight enough for measured resources. A key area where the battery industry differs from other resources industries is in the required purity of the output. Qualification is the process whereby users of material test potential suppliers to make sure that the material is suitable. Qualification is necessary before users will commit to offtake agreements and can take of the order of 12 to 24 months. During this time, projects have to prove that they can provide material to spec on a consistent basis. Pilot plants and demonstration plants are becoming de rigueur for development projects so that companies have enough material available for testing by cathode and battery manufacturers. The requirements for material may be of the order of 5 tonnes. If a company is not factoring in an adequate qualification period in their development schedule, the chances are that they haven't adequately engaged with their customers. There are a number of other factors that investors should keep an eye on. Firstly, do collars and cuffs match? What do I mean by this? Well, I'm aware of at least one development plan that included costs for 99% purity material, but revenues for 99.9% .9 material. Now, given what I've said about the costs incurred when increasing the purity of a product, I'm sure you can understand the impact that that emission might have on project economics. Another important point is what sort of technology is the company utilizing and has it adequately tested that? One of the recurring issues in evaluation of development projects is that the market does not apply an adequate risk discount to new processing technologies. I've been a mining analyst for 20 years now, and I can count the number of successful new processing technologies that have come through in that time on the fingers of one hand. If a company plans to use a new technology, then an analyst needs to apply a higher discount rate to the project. The discount rate can come down as the company goes through product testing, but an investor needs to be realistic that new tech often doesn't work either at the cost or utilization level for which it was intended. Investors should also consider how big is the management team and what is their experience. There comes a time when a company goes from development into construction where it needs to build out the management team. Companies that outsource key development skills tend to end up overpaying and having contractors under delivering. In addition, the CEO often ends up becoming overstretched. It's important that companies build out their management teams early enough and with enough technical and industry skills. Finally, what is the life cycle impact of the project? What are the greenhouse gas emission implications of the planned project? How much water is used and reused? What provisions have been made for waste? And what are the key reagents and what is their impact on the environment? All of these issues are likely to be increasingly relevant in the future when considering projects making battery materials. They're things that OEMs are looking at now, so you as an investor should be aware of them as well. So thanks very much for listening to this presentation. If you want more information, you can listen to our Recharge podcast at the address below, or you can subscribe to our monthly journal at www.batterymaterialsreview.com, or you can tune in to more of our Investor's Guide series via our YouTube page. 
If there are any topics you'd like me to discuss in the future, please leave a comment on the YouTube page or drop me a line via the Contact Us section on the Battery Materials Review website. I'm Matt Fernley, editor of Battery Materials Review, and goodbye for now.